Be excellent to each other and party on, dudes. We're back with a 5 0 Jeskai Stone Blade list. Here's the list right here. Uh, let me make this a little bit bigger. So, as you can see, can I make the cards bigger? Oh, yeah, there we go. Really big. All right. As you can see, uh, we've got quite a collection of powerful spells all jammed into a very reliable mana base. Uh, a lot of times people call dual land heavy mana bases greedy, but I actually call basic heavy mana bases greedy. This is a very greedy mana base in the sense that I'm playing eight basics and I'm also playing prismatic Vista and, and I'm only playing uh, five non prismatic Vista fetches and I'm only playing three dual lands in the entire deck. Uh, I love playing dual. Lands. I've, I've got play sets in FBB of all the blue dual lands. Like I'm definitely going to jam as many as I can, but in this case, I really do like having basics because they really do just give you like a sense of inevitability against wasteland decks, against lands, against a lot of the other decks that want to disrupt your mana base. And also they make, you know, you go up against moon stompy. They, they're like very proud of their turn one blood moon. And then you just proceed to play a whole bunch of basics and, completely invalidate that plan it's a great feeling so let's talk about the the main cards of course stoneforge mystic the main creature in the deck snapcaster we got two of these these can help recur your inexpensive interaction spells two dress downs i think these are really strong especially in a deck that's trying to buy time you can clear construct tokens you can stuff etb triggers uh like for example opposing stoneforge mystics basically anything out of death and taxes uh you can s slow down the growth of a Orcish Bowmasters. Orcish Bowmasters is pretty unimpressive when you respond by dress downing and then you just hold your cantrips until you can clear it. They basically, you basically drew a card and they didn't get any value, right? So it's a strong card right now. Then uh, Brazen Borrower, a pet card of mine, belongs in basically every card with an island in it. Two Force of Wills. Uh, oh, by the way, I think of Brazen Borrower as kind of like Prismatic Ending number four. Generally, I don't think it's correct to play four Prismatic Endings. I don't think very many people do. Brazen Borrower is uh, a pitchable. Uh, it pitches to force. And it also deals with certain permanents like Leyline of the Void if they're playing Helm Combo. That, it saved me so many times. It's instant speed, so it'll take out a uh, Merit Lage token. It'll do a lot of things that Prismatic Ending won't do. So I think it's a nice uh, substitute. And then uh, here's where we get a little wild. We've got four Narset and we've got two Teferi. That's a lot of Planeswalkers in a post Bowmasters world. Uh, and then fourth Aerolingus, I'm not wild about. I, I don't actually think it, it belongs in the deck. Uh, you'll see why during this league. But it it's it's kind of clunky, and I don't like having to tap out for it when I've got cards like Snapcaster in my deck, when I've got the ability to hard cast Force of Negation and things like that. So... Yeah, well, let's dive in. Uh, before we do, real quick, I'm just going to show you the sideboard, though. I'm, I love Ruination. Uh, I don't get to cast it during this league, but uh, basically my opponent concedes when they see it uh, during one of the games, and it's just such a powerful card. And I'm not a huge fan of Back to Basics or Blood Moon in this deck. You can't power out a Blood Moon turn one like you can with red decks. Uh, I think Ruination is better because it just it just has massive card advantage. You play a turn four Ruination and you wipe three or four of their lands, they're probably not going to recover from that. And the Festivities is a great card as well. You'll get to see that in action. Uh, it's one mana and it destroys all the X1s on their board, which of course include Bowmasters and Orc armies that haven't grown. Uh, and it also is it's just so strong against Death and Taxes, so strong against a lot of fair matchups, uh, devastating against, for example, Cradle Control. I'm still playing one meltdown, but the real spotlight of this deck, of course, the the cheap interaction, the hydroblast and pyroblasts and surgical extractions. But the the real highlight of the sideboard is the two containment priests, two Lavinias, and one damping sphere. These are hateful permanents that are very strong against combo matchups, and uh, you just control has a problem with combo, especially like these kind of fair mid rangey control decks that are trying to win through creature combat damage and stuff. Uh, and in and, and at least one matchup, I side out the entire Stoneforge package and side in my Lavinia's, my Containment Priests, and like my Hateful Permanents to be able to stop my opponent. So these should be uh, five really exciting games. I'm going to go, I've already 
of course, won the league. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, go through them one by one. One thing to note is the reason I do this is because I can slow things down. I can talk. I hope the commentary is going to be better because I'm not like looking at the clock. And I'm not worried about like making some sort of uh, misclick or anything like that. I can really just focus on analyzing what happened from the perspective of the game has already happened. I already know what's going to happen. So it's not just like, oh, I wonder what they're going to draw next. Oh, no, they drew that card. You know, it's like I kind of already know what's going to happen so I can talk more about the strategy. So the point of these videos is to help people get better at playing blue, fair blue control decks like I play. And I think that this kind of analysis is probably less exciting than watching somebody play in real time. But I do think it's potentially more uh, instructive. All right. So this is a weak opener. And I wouldn't normally keep this. Uh, I don't know exactly what my opponent's on. The main risk here is keeping a hand that relies on Brainstorm to put back bad cards like Batterskull or land number four. You just you don't want to risk them thought seizing or griefing your Brainstorm, and then you just have a terrible hand. Uh, but I keep this anyway. And in retrospect, it was probably a mistake, but considering their turn one play, it actually works out great. So I immediately see the Volcanic Island, and I'm like, oh, no, they're, oh, wow, they're not Delver, they're Dredge, Blue-Red Dredge. This is the new hot version of Dredge that people are playing. So thankfully, Force of Negation not only stops the front end of Faithless Looting, but it also stops the flashback by just exiling it outright. So this is an easy exile. The general heuristic against dredge decks is you force the first thing they put on the stack. Now, they put another scary card, Lion's Eye Diamond, on, on the stack. They've got four cards in their deck. I don't know what to do from here. I just have to let them do it and hope that they don't have some explosive hand with like a bunch of uh, dredge creatures. So pretty much the worst top deck possible, another land. So now I've got five lands and a batter skull, and I've got no path forward. I can just play a land and wait. But luckily... They are stalled out as well. They have a second land, which they don't really even need more than one land. Uh, so I kind of look at that as a blessing. And then boom, planes plus my off the top Stoneforge Mystic. Stoneforge Mystic is going to go fetch my Cauldra. And it's going to represent uh, essentially like a four, four turn clock starting next turn. So I get the Cauldra. And they play Colosseum. And... I would absolutely play Calder out, but now there's this Narset here, and I'm like, well, I'm not going to not play Narset against a face-up Cephalid Coliseum. So I go ahead and I play the Narset. And Narset finds me the juiciest stack of cards. Look at these. My goodness. So many options. But I'm going to go ahead and take the Force of Will, and the reason I'm going to take the Force of Will is it gets me halfway to being able to shut off their most broken stuff even though I don't have a blue card to go with it, a brainstorm, if uh, I can find a brainstorm off the next Narset. So they, they cast Faithless Looting right away. I'm getting value off Narset, right? Like they can't draw any cards. All they can do is put a few cards in their graveyard. It's still correct to do that. I don't think they misplayed uh, because it's not going to get any better. Their deck doesn't really have good ways to remove Narset. So they're just, they're just trying to uh, get stuff in the yard like so they can get closer to potentially activating this. Um yeah, I mean, it's efficient use of their mana, I guess. So here we go with yet another land off the top. Fortunately, Narset is here to help me find some better stuff. I should take Brainstorm here. I actually take the other Narset, I think. I, if I would taken Brainstorm there, it would have been so much better because I would have been able to Brainstorm back probably the Batter Skull and one of these lands. Uh, but yeah, I you also note that I don't play Calder here. I think at this point I was worried that they might have uh, some sort of instant speed way to get like another Icarid or something in play. And I didn't want to lose my Narset and give them a chance to use Cephalid Coliseum because they've got so much mana. That's probably overly cautionary. I probably should have gone ahead and called her there. So they play an Archimede, which is not a big deal. And I just put in my Caldera. So again, it's not going to be a four turn clock anymore. It's going to be, well, now it's going to be four turns from this turn because I'll start attacking. So this Snapcaster doesn't really do anything, although I actually am representing uh, Snapcaster into Force Negation, which is nice, or Hardcast Force. But I think instead, I do now that I have the second blue card, I do go ahead and play out the, uh, the second. Um, I attack first. So my heuristic is you play a land, 
you attack, then you cast spells. And that's what I do like 90% of the time just so I don't have to think about it because thinking takes time and time is precious. Not in this matchup, but in, as we'll see in round three um, where I finish the, the match with like 30 seconds on the clock, uh, these heuristics save me from going to time. Okay, so here we have another Force of Will, which would probably be good. We also have a Prismatic Ending, which I can just go to remove that Narc Amoeba, thus ensuring that I not only get another activation off Narset, but I get to keep Narset in play. So I go ahead and take the Force or the Prismatic Ending, and I just go ahead and remove it. So again, I left a damage on the table, which is relevant, because if they were at 12, they'd be two attacks from death instead of three. But that's how my heuristic works, and they go ahead and concede anyway. So I think that was probably a premature concession, considering they had another draw, but I don't know what's in their hand. Game two. So this is a much better opening hand, if I recall correctly. Look at that. So I boarded in my Lavinia's. I boarded in my Containment Priests. I'm basically full bore anti uh, dredge at this point. And having a hateful permanent in my hand right up from the beginning is super strong. So they open with LED. I force, again, my heuristic always force the first spell that dredge puts on the stack. Uh, but they do have a follow up here. They have a faithful saluting, which I can't do anything about since I already used my force. So I don't think it was like results oriented thinking. Maybe that was a misplay. Uh, they would have been able to put, assuming they didn't draw the Golgari Grave Troll or the Stinkweed Imp, they probably would have been able to put a dredger into play off the LED. So I think it's still correct to force the LED just in case they don't have some other enabler. All right. So now uh, Island Ponder, we're going to see what we find. We find a force, which I think I'm going to hang on to. But actually, that's what I should have done. I should have held on to that force, but I, I'm like, let's high roll it. And I, of course, get punished by drawing Cryptic Coat, which isn't particularly strong here. I mean, it's kind of a dead card. It'll pitch to a force if I find one. He's got Otherworldly Gaze, which is a really good uh, card in this deck, a more recent addition to the deck that really makes his deck a lot stronger. And he goes and cracks the LED, and he's got Faithless Looting Mana. So, yeah, like, I'm in a pretty bad place now. Even with Lavinia here, Lavinia is slow. It take, it's, it's a turn two play. And Dredge is, like, basically a, a critical turn two deck. And we're now going to see them go off, so to speak. But I catch a serious break and look at what they Dredge. They do not have any Narc Amoebas in here. And without a Narc Amoeba, they can't flashback Cabal Therapy, so they can't get Poxwalkers into play. And they can't start sacking things to generate a uh, bridge from below zombies. And they do have two bridge from the below uh, in their graveyard. So I just got very lucky here, frankly. And I would imagine my opponent's pretty tilted um, because I think they concede pretty prematurely here in a second. This uh, Lavinia is very strong in that it does shut off Cabal Therapy flashback. And it does stop them from flashing back Faithless Looting, even if they do rip an LED. No, actually, it doesn't because the, the mana value of Faithless Looting is one and they have a land in play. Uh, so it doesn't really do that much because, again, I wasn't expecting them to explode uh, so aggressively. But luckily, another whiff for a Narc Amoeba. At this point, they've looked at uh, 30 cards in their deck and they found zero Narc Amoebas. Just to, double, to confirm, yeah, they don't have any in our Exile. It's just bad variance on their part. So at this point, I um, I go ahead and ponder. Uh, I find some brainstorms and a plow. I think I should. Oh, but they just res they just go ahead and concede when I uh, ponder. I'm not sure why they conceded there, but I would have definitely taken the brainstorm and just chilled and beat them down. Uh, I'm not sure what I could have done. I mean, I might have. I would have played a land and probably a brainstorm to try to find. A Containment Priest. Containment Priest is the real card that ends this game. But it's a W. I'll take it. Um, and now we're going into round two. Yeah, I only lost two games this entire uh, league. So this deck is definitely strong considering it's my first time to play Jeskai on MTGO. I normally have been playing Esper, but I've been a little underwhelmed by Thoughtseize. And I was thinking, like, having a Splash Color is a big commitment, especially if you just have like Bowmasters and Bowmasters 
doesn't really do anything in the non-fair matchups. It's just not that powerful against combo. Um, so yeah, my thinking is currently like, let's, let's try Jessica. I'm not sure that Jessica is better, but, um, I'm having fun with it. So here we go. Exploration. I think this is a force, um, because if they don't have anything, you know, if they don't have a mox diamond into, you know, life of the loam, like crazy nut draws that lands have, we're probably good. So I go ahead and I pitch a Narset. You always want to pitch your three drops early on. It feels bad, but she's not going to do a lot in this matchup anyway. Dress down is insane in this matchup, and it's great that I have it main deck. I wouldn't be surprised if I'm able to get some value off it right off the bat in this first game. So here, uh, my mana is a little bit shaky. I'm definitely going to pitch to Fairy, but look who's here. Urza Saga. Unfortunately, in this case, I do think it's correct to go ahead and hit the Reclaimer. Uh, he's going to have to put mana into his Saga tokens and everything, but Reclaimer is just such a power per powerful permanent if you let it let him run away with it. And I don't know how soon I'm going to draw a plow. Uh, I've got dress down to deal with these, and I can just chill and wait till I draw a land. So I, I do go ahead and force pitching Teferi. Again, I'm sad about that because Teferi can actually kind of time walk Urza Saga players by like bouncing it, but I don't know if I'm going to draw a land. And I wouldn't have drawn a land. So here, Brainstorm gives us a chance to put the Calder back, and this is perfect. We can put Calder back, we can put back one of the lands, and we can take the fetch, and we can go f fetch a planes. But I actually, I opted to just keep the planes too. Interesting. Okay, so here, I think I go ahead and fetch a planes. All right. And I feel in the driver's seat here, I'm going to wipe out his, both of his constructs, but I always let them go get an equipment because they might get like Shadow Spear or something thinking they're going to have constructs, but no, they get Expedition Map and they play Dark Depths. Crushed. This is really bad for me because I have an answer for these constructs, but they're like one turn away, maybe two turns away from uh, getting the Merit Lage token in play. So they swing in and I always wait till combat and then I'm just like, all right, I'll clear it. And another land. So I'm feeling really dumb for having kept a land back. Like, I don't know at the time if I was, but I definitely feel now, like looking at my hand, that was an unfortunate uh, series of events. At this point, like something's happening with the MTGO player. I think MTGO had like a minor outage or something. So I have to click this button and it, it makes stuff advance really fast. Uh, and I, I'll have to do this in subsequent rounds too uh, for round three. So I apologize for the abruptness. But yeah, sometimes the MTGO client just gets screwed up like this. So I'm going to go ahead and force this to prevent them from shutting off my Teferi because even though Teferi isn't doing a whole lot here, uh, I do want to ideally draw another card. And this is another artifact if they get constructs out. I, you know, I could, there's not a lot of cards to force in lands. The best cards to force are definitely crop rotation, but I think here it's fine to force this. So that's what I do. Okay, and now they have Thespian Stage, which I believe they they got with uh, Expedition Map, so no surprise there. That's definitely a, a good call on their part. So now uh, they probably are thinking, okay, I can just kill him, but there's going to be a catch because he's still playing the game. And uh, yeah, Teferi, I'm almost a hard cast Calder mana. I just need one more land, I think. So here comes Merit Lage. Again, because I have Teferi out, like I'm not really afraid of anything. They can't crop rotate for Sejuri step or anything like that, so I can just plow in combat. Uh, and they have another depth. Uh, I draw another dress down, which is great, but thankfully I've got Stoneforge. And so I think Stoneforge, and here I just go get, I think, Batter Skull to put myself above 20 life. Oh, I get Cryptic Coat. So Cryptic Coat goes wide, and that's why it's so, such a strong addition to the deck. Uh, given time, I can just get a whole lot of threats on the table and overpower uh, cards like Maze of Ith, which lands generally play at least one Maze of Ith main deck. So, yeah, they're going to make it again. So I go ahead and get Calder in play, and I attack. Note that, again, I'm at six mana, so I can, I can equip Calder to other permanents if they somehow are able to remove it. They don't generally have a way to remove it. Some lands decks play Swords to Plowshares. All right, so Merit Lage is in play. Again, I'm going to wait till it attacks and reluctantly plow it, putting them at 51 life. So 
yeah, the, this is where like clocks come into play when somebody is at 51 life. But fortunately, this player is playing very slowly. So even though I've had to make a lot of decisions, um, because they're playing slower, I'm actually favored in terms of clocks. So here, I know that they have uh, a wasteland, but I mean, it still is producing mana. It's, it's not the worst to just go ahead and play it out, in my opinion. And I can use that mana immediately. I can play out a Cryptic Coat. And I have the mana to both bounce and replay with Stoneforge Mystic, my Cryptic Coat. All right, so they waste the Tundra predictably. They play a Mox Diamond, which doesn't really do anything this late in the game. It does provide Teferi with a nice target for something to bounce next turn. So I swing in. Of course, this is unblockable. These can be blocked. This can be mazed. Uh, generally, mazing this is kind of a pain because like all these have Ward 2, which really taxes mana, especially since they decided to Wasteland me, even though there was not really any tactical benefit to doing so. Crucible Worlds, I must stop. Hard cast, Force of Negation. Force of Negation is such an underrated card, in my opinion, just because late game, you you can uh, stop things. Um, and it's you know it's a nice one-for-one. One. It even exiles it, which incidentally is extremely good against Life from the Worm decks. All right. Uh, swinging in with the team, getting mazed. Nothing surprising here. I'm even swinging in with Stoneforge itself. Because I did the math and figured out that I didn't have the mana to both bounce and put it back in. Uh, but actually, I think now that I look at it, the math was wrong. I could have uh, bounced and put it back in. So, um, yeah. Kind of missed out on uh, a token there. I was trying to play fast. I knew the game was going long. Uh, this game one was very long. Uh, you can see the clocks were already like more than 30 minutes into the game. All right. So attacking with a whole lot of permanence. Uh, Soul Guide Lantern. Fortunately, my deck barely even uses the graveyard. So I feel very insulated from basically anything they can do here, except uh, Merit Lage across two turns could kill me. With the Shadow Spirit, it's actually still lethal with this, uh, with this in play. Because so, I'm only going to go up to 21, and a Shadow Spirit gives it a plus one, plus one. So... Uh, my Teferi is no longer in play, so I can't even Prismatic in. Luckily, they didn't draw. I think they played three depths. They didn't get the third depths. And for whatever reason, they never found... I mean, they didn't look at that many cards, even though it was a really long uh, game. The thing to remember about lands is they don't have any card selection in their deck other than being able to search for things like crop rotation. So the fact that my opponent didn't find a Life from the Loam is not entirely surprising if they had... I had Force Negation in my hand for most of the game. So I felt like I... Played that one pretty tight. Uh, even the, with those little uh, point hemorrhages that I had, just little decisions like uh, not efficiently using my Stoneforge to put called, uh, Coat back into play. Yeah. Little things like that that I hope to improve with practice. Okay. So Mox Diamond. This is like an extremely explosive hand. I didn't want to force the exploration. Uh, in retrospect, I should have forced it probably because now... They, they've got two lands in play, and if they have uh, Life from the Loam, I'm really in trouble. Keep in mind, my opponent's clock has gotten very low. My opponent, uh, I think they stepped away or something happened with their connection or something, but they're, they have to win two games in five minutes. So at this point, like basically, I just need to, instead of playing to win, I just need to cowardly play not to lose, or play to not lose. Uh, yeah, and they've even got um, Ghost Quarter, which does hurt my... Over time, Ghost Quarter can remove enough basics, even from my deck, that I don't, that I'm no longer able to cast cast my spells. So I ponder. I don't find anything but another ponder. Meanwhile, they are loaming. Uh, forcing a loam was kind of a desperate thing to try to get some tempo. I'm not sure that it was correct. All right, surgical extraction, so we can get rid of it. We see their entire deck here, which includes a couple chokes. You always want to be on the lookout for choke. Force of Vigor does very little against my deck. I'm surprised you brought it in. Uh, this should probably be boarded out. It does nothing against my deck except potentially screw up some of my... I, I, I'm having a hard time believing that he doesn't have a better card in his sideboard than Soul Guide Lantern. Um, and then two Elvish Reclaimers. One of the reasons I keep my plows in, uh, even though Prismatic Endings will hit, I'll take. I'll leave one or two plows in if I think they're playing uh, this Haywire Mite. It's a nice, tasty 
a card that can potentially remove Cauldra or other equipment. And then, of course, they have Boseju. Um, yeah, so like not a lot of really scary stuff here, in my humble opinion. So how do I get this to go away? Oh, I think I just clicked this. Yeah, all right, cool. So I exile the surgicals. By the way, if you're an MCGO, always make sure you actually click the, the one that's in their graveyard. I've accidentally left a life on the loam in there when I was surgicaling, and my opponent's like, sure, thanks for removing the other three loams from my deck, but I'm on a loam now. And that was, you know, a game, like I lost that game. Um, all right, so here we go with the Stoneforge Mystic. Uh, I think it's correct to go ahead and get probably Coat here, just in case they remove this, but also because they do have Maze of Ith. Uh, I might have gotten Caldera though. No, I got Coat. Okay, cool. Yeah, Coat is such an amazing card. I've said it like 10 times probably just in this one recording. I love the card. It's the, the card that got me really excited about playing Stoneforge again. All right, so here, bringing back Snapcaster, we are going to go ahead and, uh, what are we doing with this? Pondering, that that was two lands and a prismatic ending, not really what we need to see. He, this is amazing, like my deck, my mana base is literally three islands right now. I got the Stoneforge out, I'm not gonna be able to use it, but it's pretty cool that the deck is so blue that it can function on basically islands, even after they waste me off my Tundra. Yeah, and at this point, they, they have three minutes left, but there's like no path to victory. Um, I'm slowly beating them down. Eventually, I'm going to get a land. I'm going to be able to dress down twice if they Saga. And Saga is really how lands decks win these days. The, uh, In my opinion, Dark Depths is very much like a backdoor or like a skilled player who has access to Sword Supply Shirt generally won't lose to Dark Depths. Okay, so this, uh, unfortunately, this is one of the, MTGO was having some issues and the replays don't work very well here. So I have to kind of like click this to get it to go through. So let's take a look at my hand. I'm gonna pause, pause. Okay, so right off the bat, you see that they're on humans and I'm gonna probably remove this with Prismatic Ending and then, uh, this force negation doesn't do a lot in the matchup because I don't really want to go down cards. I'm not sure where I cast it. I'm going to try to get it to advance. So as you can see, it's just not advancing. Uh, so I'm going to hit this again and it's going to, it's going to speed things up. Then I'm just going to see if I can slow it down. Okay. Okay. So I did indeed prismatic end that. So they cast this card as per Sentinel, which is a total pain in the ass. Uh, in my opinion, you got to remove it, but it's like, it's one of those cards where it's like, do I really want to burn a plow on this? And unfortunately, okay, I've never even seen this card before. Rally at the Hornburg. I create two 1-1 one, one white creatures. Uh, it's a red card. Again, a card that seems like a limited card, but it, it happens to have enough synergy that it's playable in this deck, I guess. Um, okay, so I have the ability to plow here. I should probably plow just to get that uh, S percentile out of the way. Let's see what I draw. Okay, it's doing the thing where it won't let me advance anymore. So, oh wait, here it goes, yeah. So I just go ahead and plow it and I pay the mana to prevent them from being able to draw. Okay, so I'm just gonna hit this to kind of like step forward a little bit. Again, sorry about the playback thing, but this is like the only way I can get it to play back correctly. Okay, so like I'm clicking it, it's just not advancing. So I think I ponder here and I get to ferry on the table and then, um, by the way, I've tried restarting and everything. Like I know a lot of people are like, oh, you can just restart the client. I like restarted my entire computer, reconnected it, everything. And th there's something about this uh, this match replay that is somehow corrupted. Okay, so at this point, uh, this Copper, Guard, Copper Coat Vanguard is quite a good card. And I think it's probably the must kill card in their deck. Um, so you can see that even though I ex exiled uh, two of their creatures, They've got more creatures. I mean, their entire deck is probably creatures and lands. So what I need to do is probably get rid of Copper Coat just because it's buffing this. And also, Esper Sentinel, you have to pay mana based on the, the power of Esper Sentinel. So now I have to pay two mana to avoid them getting a card. So I think the correct sequence is probably getting 
But if I don't get rid of Copper Coat, I'm taking a lot of damage. And even though it may not seem like that much, it does add up quickly. One thing to note is it doesn't give itself ward. For some reason, I thought it gave itself ward. So I accidentally paid more mana than I needed to here. Okay, so let's go ahead and... Okay, so here, I removed that. Um, and... Cavern of Souls, of course, Bane of uh, Blue Mages. So I do go ahead and force here. Unfortunately, uh, yeah, I, I can just pay to avoid the, them drawing a card, and that's what I do. So at this point, I, they are going to draw a card here because you just can't leave Mother of Runes in play. Uh, I think it's almost always a mistake to let Mother of Runes stay in play because it can just take over the game and really become an ordeal to remove it. If you, So if you get a chance to remove it, remove it is what I say. Okay, so now I'm going to be able to plow here. Uh, and I am going to plow Mother Runes. All right. And now they're casting this guy, which I didn't know what this guy was. I'd never seen it. In it, Inti, Seneschal of the Sun. Okay. So basically, uh, whenever any creature attacks, you can put a plus one, plus one on a uh, target creature and it gains trample until the end of the turn. Trample's not that big of a deal. Sometimes it is. But this is the big thing. Whenever you discard one or more cards, exile the top card of your library, you may play that card until your end up, uh, until your next end step. This is kind of like the reckless impulse type thing that um, a lot of red cards have now. Um, like you don't draw it, but you do get to see it and you can potentially play it until the end of the next turn. So it's a pretty good card advantage for them and considering they're empty on cards and I've got a pretty gassed up hand, like basically as gassed up as a two card hand can be, uh, I do want to get rid of this guy. So I'm taking more damage. Anti's triggering. It's going to buff up the Esper Sentinel, which is going to make it even harder for me to remove Esper Sentinel because now I'm going to... Oh, wait. For some reason, uh, they didn't put the uh, counter on. I'm not sure why he didn't put a counter on Esper Sentinel. Maybe I misread the card. But uh, Snapcaster is going to come in, and we are going to plow. And I think the correct plow here is probably uh, Anti, but of course... I didn't think about this at the time. Caracas is on the table. So, of course, like, everybody's probably done this. I've done it more times than I'm uh, proud to admit. Uh, and he's able to bounce it back to hand. So, really, what do I accomplish there? A slight tempo benefit, but I, I should have 100% plowed this. Also, he got to draw a card. Uh, uh, no, He didn't get to draw a card, I don't think, because I have enough mana to pay the tax. Okay, so NT's back. Uh, coming in this time, he's not he's not risking me uh, blocking his Esper Sentinel, which I would snap block if uh, he sent it my way. Here, not trading with this might be a mistake because now it's a two two. All right, and again, I'm gonna have to click this thing. So, pardon like the weird time warp thing. Okay, so now I've got uh, Flood of Strand, which is not the best top deck, but it does make it to where even if my Stoneforge is removed, I can cast Batter Skull. So now Inti's coming in. It's going to buff. Uh, so I'm going to block Inti. Yeah, and he bl he bounces. So not only did I just get tempo, but I also uh, saved myself two damage. And then another mom. Oh, no. Inti's back. So he's Hellbent again. I've got Batter Skull. Let's see if Batter Skull can take over the game. Important to note that my time is already like two minutes lower than his. Uh, I've been having to make a lot of decisions. I've never played against his deck before, so I'm spending a lot of time reading his cards. All right, so Ponder's a great rip. Uh, and, okay, so it's just the first spell that you have to pay. So I was able to Ponder into a Plow and then Plow the Mom. Again, this Esper Sentinel has been taxing me like crazy, but there's always a more important threat that I have to remove, like Mom. So uh, it would be great. In a perfect world, Esper Sentinel would have been removed a long time ago, but sometimes you just have to adapt your uh, adapt your play around the fact that there's an even more warping presence. Okay, Batter Skull's on the table. So I can already tell you he's going to block bounce. That's generally that's a very sound strategy against this. This is not a bad card. I might be able to surprise him somehow. So we're going to warp ahead, and it's a block bounce. All right, so this card, this is like Gideon for one mana. 
So you, uh, Gideon Battleforged, it's a really weak Planeswalker, but it's still, it's a Planeswalker that essentially costs one mana. So all he has to do is attack with his creature and attack with two other creatures. But frankly, Batter Skull has Vigilance. He's never going to get a chance to attack. So you can see my clock burning as I'm thinking very hard. This is a lot of combat math to be done, and I'm not like a seasoned combat damage counter player, you know? Uh, I don't play modern or any formats where you, you typically have these situations where you have a lot of creatures on the table. You have to really make uh, nuanced decisions around this. Like, I play Legacy, and mostly it's, you know, they have a few threats, and it's not it's not that complicated. So it's still, I'm still getting better at it. I'm actively trying to improve. Uh, so one of the decisions is I could play Teferi here, uh, but if I play Teferi, what am I going to bounce? Uh, it would probably be Esper Sentinel. If I try to bounce that, he'll stuff it. Uh, let's see what I do here. So I do play Teferi. I pay the tax. And, uh, I th oh, I bounce the token, of course, because the token is just like a removal spell, effectively. So at this point, um, I go ahead and swing in. He bounces, uh, predictably, denying me life gain. I'm at five. He's at 24, right? So Thalia's Lieutenant, uh, which grows with each creature he plays, uh, Unfortunate, and also note that even if I wanted to force it, I can't because of caverns. The fairy is still alive. I can tick him up. Uh, he can serve as a distraction uh, for my opponent. This is an amazing draw. So I go and get Caldera, and I can use the other one to put Caldera in play. So this is what I like to call Voltron. Uh, and I'm just going to let it play quickly while I talk about Voltron because the game is over. Like, all, assuming he doesn't have a removal spell, which I can force. Now it's just about protect the queen on my Caldra token because I can equip the better skull to the Caldra and then block bouncing and all that stuff is not going to matter. I'm going to gain nine each turn. He's going to lose nine. There's nothing he can do about it. And I put him in the abyss very quickly. So we'll just go ahead and speed toward the conclusion here. It's not particularly interesting. Uh, Voltroning is like my favorite thing to do. It's it's one of the reasons I love this deck so much. Uh, I have Voltron with a GTA on top of these other two equipment. Back when GTA was playable, I don't think it's playable anymore. Uh, but I've never done it with coat as well. That would be the dream is to have a coat, um, creature plus these two equipment on it. So maybe that'll happen at some point, but you can see like he's trying to do it, but like, he's not going to be able to race my life gain and everything. Like even this creature, I've got first strike and I'm going to exile anything that's big enough. Uh, yeah. So the game's over. Uh, he, what he's doing here is he's playing, he's making me attack and do all this stuff, uh, because my time is so low. And I, I respect that. That's totally like a legit angle. I took more time to think, and now I'm paying the price for that time to think. So this is a very long, eventful game. Having to learn how to play against his deck while I play it. Uh, Thalia makes an appearance. That's good to know about. I don't really have any reason to do anything other than just attack because I need to preserve time on my clock. And he finally concedes. Okay. Game two. This is uh, a game, I think the first game in the set that I've lost, and I make a misplay here. So first, let's, let's, let's pause this, look at my opening hand. This is a strong opening hand. Like, this is about as strong as it gets. Uh, there's really no reason I should lose from here. Especially because he's not playing like a tier deck. He's playing a deck that has a lot of synergy. It is a fair non-blue deck, which is favored automatically against my fair blue deck. But it's not just... It's not like I'm playing against a super optimized death and taxes or cradle control type matchup. So let's see if it'll let me advance one click at a time. It's not letting me do that for some reason. So I'll just click the fast button. All right. So here we're going to see uh, copper coat as I established, like that's a card you want to get rid of. It gives reward to the opponents and taxes mana because I'm not playing a lot of uh, non-basics. I don't really have to worry about his mana denial plan. I'm almost certain he has four forces in there. Um, and then he's got lots of creatures that give ward and, and he's got the Esper Sentinel, the taxes. So here I am even more favored in my opinion. Like, like this game should be mine. But what happens, you'll see in a second. So this card is not the end of the world. I can Prismatic End when, he d when he's tapped out. And I imagine that's what I do here instead of playing Caldera. Maybe I play Caldera just to get the clock going, but I think... Going ahead and getting rid of that right now while he's tapped out is better. Uh, I'm a cautious player, and I rarely will put Caldera out when I have the ability to just remove it. I decided to go ahead and brainstorm here to try to high roll, and uh, 
in retrospect, like that was an unnecessary risk. I might not have found another land. I might not have been able to take this out. And I might have just been sitting there with two land and nothing to do. But I did find my land drop. Uh, and I can probably put back, I don't know, like a, maybe the ponder, the snapcasters. Not, not terrible considering I have a, let's see what I put back. If it'll let me advance, it's not letting me advance. So let's see, what is it? I have to click this and then, okay. So we, yeah, we did in, in fact put back the cantrips and I went ahead and put the, the call in. I, I think retrospect, I probably should have gone ahead and prismatic then it. Now he's playing this card, which is really bad. I 100% should have forced this card. This is what cost me the game. If I had forced this card, Adeline, Resplendent Cathar, I was like, oh, no big deal. I'll just trade. Yeah. Hey, I'm recording. Go away. I'll come. I'll be out in a little bit, okay? All right. Uh, my daughter came in to surprise me. So if I force here, I think the game's a lock, basically. I don't know what's in his hand. He's got three, three mana. Um, but for some reason, I let it resolve thinking like, oh, it's just a, you know, a, it's a white creature. White creatures are not that game warping, right? Well, I was wrong. Because uh, this card does a lot of damage to me. I'm at 16. There's 16, right? It's not really even a race. I've got Caldera. But nope. Uh, the letting that resolve was just such a catastrophic misplay in retrospect. So I've got this force in my hand. I don't really have anything to do with it. Uh, I removed the Cathar because he's tapped out of Caracas. Or uh, the it, it, What was it called? Like Itty... Uh, NT, yeah, I removed the NT, but he's he's got quite a clock on the table. This is two, and then it's gonna be three and four, and then this is what happens. Okay, so maybe this wasn't the card I needed to force, but this is absolutely the card I need to force. Check this out, Copper Coat Vanguard. So it pumps this. It's also gonna pump the creature that gets created. It pumps this, and everything cascades. Now this has Ward. Like I definitely needed to force this. This was the card I needed to force, probably. Now, if this weren't on the table, if I'd forced this, I wouldn't have needed to force this. But not forcing this and not forcing this, I have been greedy as hell. And no amount of Snapcastering Swords of Plowshares is going to uh, absolve me of my greediness. One of the seven deadly sins. It's not going to absolve me of my sin. So, there we go. Swinging in. And you could argue that I shouldn't have even swung in there. I could copper coat to uh, to get rid of these, but like the game's over. Like he, he's got lethal. Um, I forced that, but I'm dead on board. Snapcaster is going to be able to uh, plow here, but I'm still taking four. Oh, uh, so plow there, block there. I take two, but what's my game plan? I've got nothing in my hand and I can't deal lethal damage this turn. And blocking is not going to win. This is where I draw fourth arrow Lingus, which is the biggest punch in the gut because this is like the one card in my deck that can't be cast right now because I didn't proactively fetch red because it's a one of, and I'm like unlikely to draw it. This makes me want to cut it. I know it's a good card, uh, but I know it has synergy with Narset in the sense that you get fourth arrow Lingus, and even if they get the Monarch, they're not going to get it back. But the kinds of decks that are able to take the Monarchy from you are also the kinds of decks that can easily deal with Narset. All right, game three. So at this point, I'm incredibly low on time because it's been very mentally taxing. So let's just see if uh, if it cooperates here. This is a strong opening hand. This end the festivities. This is what you put it in your sideboard for, for uh, for fair white, and fair green matchups with lots of like mana dorks and mother of runes and stuff like that. So I go fetch uh, here. This is perfectly reasonable. Um, Brazen borrower is quite good. Teferi will take a couple turns to come down, but I've got land number three. I think I shouldn't shuffle this. I should just ramp, uh, work toward getting Stoneforge Mystic into play, getting Caldera. So, um, again, note, five minutes on the clock, which is not a lot of mana, uh, not a lot of time when you're playing a uh, Stoneforge Mystic deck. So I play my lands. Stoneforge is in, Calder's in hand. Bile, probably not going to matter considering that they don't have a whole lot of uh, cards in their hand. All right. This is where I'm like, okay, I could do a lot of things here. But I, oh, and by the way, I shuffled away Teferi when I went for a Caldera. So I'm not going to get that, that Teferi, which would have been nice. But it's, it's like in retrospect, Teferi would have been a terrible card here with these cards in play. Luckily, you're going to see me snipe them both. 
So, oh, another land. Again, land is great in this matchup. Look at my hand. I need it. I'll take all the land I can get. So uh, I do Prismatic Vista. I end the festivities, and I just attack here uh, with my Stoneforge. Um, here they are able to double spell effectively. Pump Talia's Lieutenant with the Coppercoat Vanguard. Again, the best card in their deck, in my opinion, based on what I've seen of it. So I'm going to speed through it. Sorry again. I, I know I keep apologizing for the MTGO like replay thing being busted for this particular match. Uh, get the Calder in play. Okay. And so I'm applying pressure. They're going to be able to hit me for two, maybe four or more, depending on how many creatures they have. But they only have three cards in the hand. Without any card advantage engine, Vile's not that scary. Note that this would be a wasteland that would be very debilitating, but I don't have to worry about it. Okay. Uh, Adeline is back. She's going to create, uh, I think she, does she create any time? Uh, yeah, any attack she creates one, even when she isn't the one attacking. So very quickly they have uh, a board presence. Also, this human grows this Thalia's, uh, what is it called? Thalia's lieutenant. So yeah, they've got a serious clock. I mean, already they're they're racing me effectively. So at this point, and also note I'm at 420 on the clock. So Snapcaster is good. Uh, unfortunately, just with the nature of the replay, we didn't, we're not able to see all the other stuff. So here, I didn't know that uh, I wouldn't get the... Um, so I uh, when I get to my turn, I do uh, attack with Calder before casting Fourth Aerolingus. I figured that casting Fourth Aerolingus would see that I had attacked, but no, uh, I misread the card. So... Note that you always have to cast Fourth Layer Lingus before you attack if you want to take the Monarchy. Whether I would want to take the Monarchy here is an open question. Uh, I think with the number of blockers I have, it's probably still pretty good to take the Monarchy. But Monarchy can spiral out of control right now. He's got uh, Aether Vial. He's got plenty of mana. He can easily cast two spells a turn. So I think it's probably actually uh, a gift that uh, Fourth Layer Lingus did not um, give me the Monarchy here. All right, so I attack. Come on, play. Hey, I'm still recording, you silly goose. Okay, so it's not, is it not going to let me get through this game? I'm just clicking all the buttons. You can see, you can probably hear my frustrated clicking. Um, okay, so here, I fourth, I've got blockers. <laughs> my daughter's being silly. Okay, so here I double block Adele. Uh, I'm just going to call her Adele instead of Adeline. I, uh, she's going to say hello to my uh, my night tokens. Okay, my daughter's being very silly. Hey, Jocelyn, I'll be in a little bit. Go somewhere else. Okay. So at this point, like, I've got one minute on my clock. Okay, he plays with Thalia. It doesn't really matter. Uh, but uh, I, I'm, yeah, Thalia's lieutenant. Lightning Bolt takes out that card. Because he doesn't swing in. He holds back. And at this point, like, I theft that, but it wouldn't really matter. Like, even though I passed the turn, I'm not going to have time to finish it. So I just had to hope that they didn't have a plow or something. I'm actually surprised. I didn't see a single plow from their deck. They may not play plow, that which is a freaking greedy. I mean, it's the best removal spell in the game. Like, you got to play plow. Lightning Bolt is no plow. I'm sorry. So, yeah, I won that one. My opponent was probably pissed because I won it with, like, 30 seconds on the clock. But, uh, yeah, I, I threw away game two uh, by not forcing. And, yeah, needless to say, I've learned a lot, and I'm going to think about that a lot uh, when I'm – in aggro matchups a, a lot of people are like oh you can board out your forces against aggro matchups but like yeah that was definitely a precarious situation okay so here unknown opponent uh i googled them they were playing like a uh jeweled uh what is it called uh it, it's it's like a coveted jewel so it comes into play and it's basically like a black lotus and an ancestral recall in one so it's a six mana artifact. You draw three cards when you cast it. You can tap to add three color of any mana. And then if your opponent attacks you, it's kind of like the monarch. They can take it away from you and they can get the uh, the effect. So I didn't want them to have any artifact shenanigans. I kept a double force hand and I felt that this was pretty conservative. And we'll see how that plays out. So here we go. 
They play City of Traders. So again, this is kind of like the glass cannony, you know, artifact type stuff where their mana is going to go away. Fable of the Mirror Breaker is definitely a card worth forcing, in my humble opinion. Uh, and I think the only reason I didn't force it is because I've got a plow. And like looking at their deck list, they didn't have any other artifact. They they have like a couple of bone masters, but they didn't really have anything else to point a, a storage the plasters at. So I'm like, I'll just get rid of the thing, the uh, the goblin token that generates treasure tokens, and then I can hold these forces. And I'm, in retrospect, I think that was correct. So it gets passed back to me. I think I should have just plowed. Uh, end of turn to preserve mana in case I needed in case I top decked like a uh, something better but I didn't do that uh, so instead I basically I have to plow now uh, and yeah again it's a minor thing if I'd been if uh, I could have potentially borrowed the token as well but borrower can stop lots of artifacts and other things like one ring so I'm really glad I held my force because look at this They've got one ring, I force, they force back, but guess what? I've got another force. So I force and they brainstorm. And thankfully they don't find another force. So it's my two cards to their two cards, but they have an artifact coming into play. So I'm down cards. I need a miracle, right? These cards suck. I need to put all these cards back. Like none of them are good in the matchup. Plow potentially removes the, the Kiki Jiki token, but that's it. Like, so... I put back the Calder that I'm not going to be able to cast for four more turns, five more turns at least. And, uh, yeah, I just have to basically hope that they don't have anything. So this is, like, definitely scary time. But, of course, not only can I remove this token with this plow, but I can follow up with a Narset. And Narset, I mean, Narset is so much better than Orcish Bowmasters, it's not even funny. Just completely shutting down their draws as opposed to just penalizing their draws. Makes a huge difference. So, uh, transmute artifact, scary. They can go get the one ring. They can go get uh, coveted jewel. They can do a lot of broken stuff. Transmute artifact. And they also have copy artifact in their deck, I found out. So, fourth arrow lingus, again, not great here, but uh, considering they don't have any artifacts in their deck, or they don't have any uh, very many creatures in their deck, I feel pretty safe going ahead and getting the monarchy that, like, Narset can keep it from them even if they somehow have a bow masters and are able to take the monarchy from me all right so here we go stoneforge mystic off the top and i'm able to basically put them on a one turn clock here check this out so i get the caldera also get the cryptic coat and they're at 12 life i'm going to be able to deal exactly 12 damage to them next turn also note that i drew a brainstorm for the monarch the monarch is pulling weight here so they do copy artifact uh, my cryptic coat which is not the end of the world and again like playing cards like lotus, lotus petal and stuff like that those are bad top decks okay so at this point i can force the transmute artifact which is probably going to go get a one ring just so they can survive a turn uh they're not going to really be able to capitalize on one ring they can tap to draw a card during my turn because narset is just only one card per turn uh, so you can draw on your opponent's turn. Uh, but I'm like, I've got everything here. So I just force, and then I know that uh, I can bounce the uh, creature uh, back to hand with Teferi, and I can still attack for lethal next turn. And even though they don't know that I had Teferi coming, they do concede to this. Game two. So now having a clear idea of their deck, this is a strong hand because Narset was obviously backbreaking for them. Well, we don't know exactly what they had in their hand, but we did find two good cards with Narset. And with the current deck configuration, I did the hypergeometric math and uh, essentially like only like maybe like two or 3% of the time is Narset going to whiff completely when you're playing something like 30 non, uh, I think I might be playing 31, 32 non land, non creature spells that I can get. So this is just non-creature, non-land. So, yeah, I mean, you can imagine like how improbable it is that you see four cards and none of those are non-creature, non-land, right? So Narset is extremely reliable for getting uh, cards. And it's almost like guaranteed draw two unless they can somehow disrupt it if, if it's able to resolve. And it's not just draw two. It's like get two of the best cards in your top eight, right? It's amazing. So, yeah, I'm happy to keep this hand. I'm probably going to pitch 
Narset, as great as she is and as much of a, a sales pitch I just gave for her, I'm probably going to pitch her to Force first because she's a later game card. Probably keep Ponder just so I have flexibility. Ruination is definitely something I want to work toward because I didn't see a single basic the previous game, but we'll see what happens this game. They open basic. So right off the bat, I'm thinking I probably want to put Ruination back if I get a Brainstorm just because it is four mana and, and lucky me, I do rip a Brainstorm. Great top deck. So they're doing turn two shenanigans, Fable of the Mirror Breaker. I don't have anything going on. I don't have a way to remove this. I think this is a force. Even knowing that they have so many broken spells in their deck, I think it's force. My opponent agrees that it's a broken card and goes ahead and forces back to keep it in play. Can I find a removal? I can't. Uh, let's brainstorm and see if we can find a removal. Boom. Prismatic ending. Source of Plashers, five through seven, coming in hot. All right, we're going to get a Plains here. I don't, I wouldn't need to get a Plains, but it's a Prismatic Vista. Um, I, I don't think there's any reason to not get non-basics, ex except for, uh, you know, my own ruination there. So I'm going to exile that, and that effectively stops them from having any red mana. They don't have any black mana. They have an island, and they have a land that does damage to them each turn. They got one card in hand, so I'm feeling pretty good. I think I'm pr very favored at this point, assuming they don't have like a crazy broken play. But their entire deck is built around doing crazy broken plays. So they discard both of their cards, a copy artifact and a force will. Note that they didn't have both force blue card last turn, so they couldn't have stopped my prismatic ending if they wanted to. But they have two unknowns in hand. All right. I'm going to go ahead and get the Stoneforge into play. I think that's more valuable. Bouncing the Fable isn't really that helpful uh, because they actually get more value when they recast it and they don't have a lot going on. Even though they don't have red mana face up, they might be able to, they might, you know, be able to get some. So I think it's better to just leave the Fable, uh, the Reflection in play. Now, one thing to note is this deck does play Chaos Defiler, which is a terrifying card, and all the more terrifying with Reflection of Kiki Jiki because they can essentially exile two of your permanents each turn. Um, but yeah, uh, I just have to kind of like let it be on the table because I need to kill them. So we're swinging. We've got kind of not really two turn clock. Okay, now it's a two turn clock because they, they tap, but they copy artifact. Again, kind of terrifying normally, but they're going to be very sad when they see that Teferi can leave the copy artifact in play as the Cauldra, but render it useless by bouncing the germ token itself. And they are nowhere near the seven mana to re-equip it. So I'm right back to beating them in the face. I've got so much gas coming. I'm here I'm going to go and probably get a, uh, yeah, the only card I can get. I actually boarded out Batter Skull because I just didn't seem like that useful. And I'd rather have an additional blue card in my deck that I could potentially force, uh, pitch to force. So yeah, the, the game is over. Um, and I think the thing that this came down to is like I got insane top decks. Uh, I think I played pretty tight. Uh, even though they were able to force my force and get Fable in play, I was able to dig for uh, removal. I think the main thing against these Fable decks that aren't really like painter style decks but are using Fable for value, color fixing, things like that, you do want to stop Fable. But even if you can't stop the Fable, you do want to stop the token before they can create treasure. Those treasure tokens are basically free Lotus Petals that they get. So... Uh, I think it's not going any further, but they, they resigned at that point. All right, last match. This was exciting because every time you get to like, you know, round five, the trophy match, your nerves start to kind of build up and you're like, oh, hang on, honey. I like, just give me a few minutes. I need to focus on what I'm doing, right? Like, and uh, yeah, it, it was definitely worth asking my wife <laughs> to give me a moment uh, so that I could close this out. All right, here we go. Underground C. So... Uh, at this point, I looked them up, and I thought they were on Doomsday because they played Doomsday extensively. Um, but, as we'll see in a second, they're not on Doomsday. But this start looks very Doomsday-ish. In fact, up until the point that they cast their surprise spell, I think they're on Doomsday. Fortunately, I have an extremely strong anti-Doomsday hand. I'm looking very much forward to Narset basically making it very slow for them to get through their Doomsday pile if they even resolve it through my double forces. But then... This is what happens. They ponder again. Okay, cool. More Doomsday stuff. No big deal. 
And I'm going to go get my Narset in play. And Narset resolves. I find a Prismatic ending, which is not good against Doomsday. It's like blank, basically. I don't think there's anything other than like Lotus Petals that you can hit with it. This is where the cast show and tell, which is terrifying. So I force. Like, thank goodness I have double force here. But they have a force of their own. So I force again. And they have another force of their own. They're going to one. One card in hand, but it's the card that they're going to put into play with show and tell. I put my Volk into play, and they put big, bad Atraxa. Now check this out. Look at how many cards this attracts against them. Show and tell. Thossie's Scalding Tarn. So they Dark Petition, terrifying card, right? Omniscience. Another show and tell. Okay, so you may be thinking, okay, well, good game. This game is over. I'm not giving up. I do not give up, especially when playing forward. Like, at least I'm getting to see more of the deck. Because I've never seen, like, I haven't played that much against Blue Black Omnitel. I play mostly against, like, Sneak and Show, which is a different deck. Um, here we go. I am basically going to wait till they attack. And I I know what they had because uh, they had nothing in hand. So I basically have perfect information about their hand, except for the card they just drew. So... They're swinging in, and I'm just going to plow it. They're going to gain a bunch of life, and I don't really have... Uh, okay, they show a tell again. I expected this. Now they're going to Omniscience. Uh, I don't cast Brazen Borrower because I can borrow the Omniscience back to, back to hand, and it's not really going to do anything for me. Cast, obviously, we knew that they had another Traxa in hand. It sucks. It's just how it's going to go down. So now they're going to get um, a whole bunch more cards. What do they get here? Omniscience, Dark Ritual, Polluted Delta, Mind's there. So they have yet another Omniscience. I think they just grabbed it, but they don't have a Force Will, importantly. Mind's Desire is scary. So I draw off the top like a champ another plow, and I'm just chilling. I can flash in this Brazen Borrower, and I can attack him 10 times. I don't think that's going to get there, but I'm going to do it. All right, um, now... Dark Ritual, Thoughtseize. Okay, take away my useless prismatic ending. Not a big deal. I was actually worried that they were going to thought uh, Dark Ritual, and then they had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, which uh, to cast Omniscience. How much does Omniscience cost? I think it's like eight. So I was worried that they were going to hard cast Omniscience, but they didn't do that. Instead, they uh, cast Mind's Desire with Three Storm. And I'm like, okay, Three Storm, that's not that bad. But then they hit Dark Petition, and I'm like, okay, well, that's game. Because they're going to get mana here, they're going to get Storm. And sure enough, they do, in fact, they show and tell here just to get Omniscience. It doesn't really matter, but it does allow them to, they cast their other Omniscience, and that allows them to get to Lethal Tendrils. So it's a pretty inventive line that they used. Not that they were at any risk of dying from Brazen Borrower. Uh, they probably could have slowed it down, but they didn't know what was in my deck. And, and keep in mind, they did all this without drawing cards. So... Kudos to my opponent for putting up quite a fight. Um, despite my very, you know, good top deck and getting that second plow. So I die here. Um, okay, game two. So this is where I bring in the hate. Total transformational sideboard. Board out all my stone forwards, forged mystics. Board out all my equipment and just board in uh, lots of hate pieces, including because they're playing a track and show and tell and stuff, including uh, the... Um, uh, including the Containment Priests. Okay. All right, so are you going to let me play? What's going on here? Is the playback not working? Uh-oh. Okay, here it is. It's just really slow for some reason. Okay, so I had a strong hand. Uh, pause. Okay, so this is where playing red is actually really helpful because I can bring in Pyroblast. Why is it not letting me pause? Okay, pause, pause. Please stop. Okay, so what has happened so far? Uh, and it's just like after you hit pause, because if DGO's client is pretty terrible, it's, sometimes it starts going again. Pause. Okay, step forward. All right, I'm trying to stop it. Okay, I think I successfully stopped it. Okay, so um, what happened was there was a counter war over Lavinia. They've got a lot of stuff in play, but so far they haven't done anything but play lands and sculpts with a brainstorm. So I've got pretty good hand. I left my four plows in just because they were so valuable at getting rid of Atraxa. Atraxa is not a card I can get rid of in other ways. I think I might have left the Prismatic Endings in as well, just in case they played a card like uh, Defense Grid, which is really problematic. 
Um, so yeah, let's go ahead and see what happens here. They show and tell. I have Pyroblast. They don't have a force. So they have four cards. Now I swing in. I've got Snapcaster, which is very good uh, when you have a Pyroblast in the graveyard. They're trying to remove my Lavinia, probably to do some broken stuff. And when I Snapcaster to stop Petty Theft, they go ahead and scoop. Not only is this going to stop Petty Theft, but it's going to stop the fairy, the Brazen Borrower itself from being in Adventure where it can come back and start hurting me. Game three. This is the one for all the marbles, right? The nerves are running. Uh, tension is in the air. Okay, so again, I get a Lavinia hand. Lavinia is really good against their deck, obviously, because it stops Force of Will and it slows down their game plan. And my whole goal is just to slow them down and get as many lock pieces into play as I can, namely Lavinia and Narset and potentially Containment Priest. So I ponder, uh, get a Brainstorm, doesn't hurt to have another blue card in my hand so I can keep my hate pieces that I don't want to pitch to force. All right. Um, so far, just sculpting on both of our sides. Now, Lavinia comes in. Importantly, this is not force of will. I can't actually defend Lavinia here. So if they had been able to force it, there's nothing I can do. I just, But I didn't want to take the risk of leaving it. I, I mean, I just had to go for it. Okay, now I've got Force of Will and Force of Negation. I'm feeling extremely favored. I think the game's basically over, but there's a lot of stuff their deck can do. I, I think at this point it is rational to go ahead and play Narset. I've still got two Force Effects, Force Blue Guard combos in my hand. I've got this kind of stinky Swords of the Plashers that I'm going to put back with a Brainstorm if I have another Blue Card. And I find yet another Swords of the yet another reason to, to Brainstorm. So again, force uh, Swords of Plashers is only good if they can get Atraxa into play, and there's no way in hell I'm letting Atraxa resolve here. So uh, we go ahead and we force. I for I start with Force of Negation just in case they're playing some sort of um, uh, Misty Mystic Sanctuary or something where they can put it back on top because they do have a lot of blue cards. Usually when they're playing un Undercity Sewers, they surveil blue lands. They're not playing Mystic Sanctuary. All right, so they don't have a follow-up, and I can play a land. I'm always happy to have more land in play, but let's brainstorm first. So I think we put back just one of the uh, the plows, and then we put back a land. We don't have a shuffle effect, unfortunately. So unfortunately, in brainstorming, I have left Force of Will orphaned in my hand, and I actually think that this was a misplay. I don't think I should have brainstormed here. I got lucky I did find another hate piece, but they've got so much mana, they can probably ignore this. And this is not even that good of a card in this matchup, but I figured it was better than, you know, like when I was boarding out the Stoneforge package, I board out the entire package. And I rarely do that, except in like total pure balls to the wall combo matchups. Sometimes I'll do that. Okay, Ruination. When I show them Ruination, like they've got mono, non-basics here. Like Ruination is going to be their death knell if they can't stop it. And... At this point, they take a draw and they concede because they can't force because of her. They can't draw cards. They probably have cantrips in their hand. I didn't ask them to see their hand. Uh, Damping Sphere shuts down like a lot of the storm potential of their deck. I feel like this is like a total victory, and it just bothers me that I brainstormed there when I could have had uh, force in my hand. So I think what I wanted to do was I was like, the odds of me not finding a blue card off Brainstorm and not finding a blue card off Narset are low. I'm safe to Brainstorm. But Ultimately, when we look at what happened, I shouldn't have brainstormed. So that concludes the analysis of those five matches. Very exciting. The most exciting of which being that humans match that I like got incredibly close to dying on. So let's go over here. Let's take a look at the deck. What changes would I make? Well, I thought four Narset was total overkill. Like no way that four Narset is correct, but Narset was a boss the entire time. I wasn't even playing against blue card blue decks for the most part. Also, you'll note that I didn't face any uh, Bowmaster decks. Like, uh, one of the decks did have a couple of Bowmasters in it, but it's, like, not, like, a full dedicated, like... I didn't play against Rescam. I didn't play against uh, Grixis Delver. So, the decks I played against, uh, let's see, Lands, and then two combo decks, and then uh, the Humans deck, and then Dredge. So, really, I played against... I think, is that, like, four combo decks, essentially? Uh, and this deck just 
shreds. I mean, if you can get your hateful permanence in play, it, it kind of shreds those combo decks. Um, but Narset was really good. I I was originally thinking like I definitely shouldn't have her in here. I think the card to cut is sadly fourth Aerolingus. It just isn't necessary. You have plenty of pressure through Stoneforge Mystic, uh, and you know you, I just didn't ever find myself wanting to tap out. So what would you replace that with? Well, I would probably. I'm not sure, really. Like, uh, we've got plenty of removal. We've got plenty of other, other interaction. I don't want to put in, like, a preordain. That's kind of lazy. You might be able to put in a third Snapcaster, but that's really stressing the mana. I think probably what I'll do is I'll put in uh, a card that I think historically has been a trap for me, which is Lorien Revealed, because Lorien Revealed is basically, like, land 21. In most cases, you're just going to cycle it. I don't actually have a way to recur it because this is so... Basic heavy, I've got like three uh, lands that are not islands. I don't, and I'm going to be actively fetching them instead of these. Uh, so I don't think Mystic Sanctuary is right in this deck. Yeah, I'm not sure what to bring in. I, I mean, Snapcaster number three is probably the most obvious inclusion. I don't want to play four drops. I just don't think they're worth playing. Jace is so fragile. And with Bowmasters in the format, like I think Jace shouldn't be played, frankly. I think it's it's effectively rotated out. Wandering Emperor is not bad. I definitely considered playing Wandering Emperor. It's a removal spell. It is a kind of a very slow creature creation engine. I don't know that we need that anymore now that we have uh, cards like Cryptic Coat. I don't think playing Cryptic Coat number two is where it's at. Uh, so, I mean, maybe you could leave a comment if you can think of a card that I should be playing here. I'm not going to play Back to Basics. I've tried Back to Basics. I think the value in playing a basic heavy Mana base like this is just not getting wastelanded, just not having shenanigans, not having to worry about Blood Moon. I don't think you need to lean into that and actually play a card like Back to the Basics. Uh, I've lost so many... I, I've tried Back to Basics a lot, and I actually traded my Back to Basics because I was just so disappointed with it. I was just like, oh, I'm not going to I'm not gonna use it anymore. Uh, the sideboard, I think, is really good. Uh, again, like this is non-negotiable when you have the risk of getting paired against a deck like... Um, Mississippi River, it, and it is really good in the off chance that you get you go up against like uh, I, I mean it's really strong against twelve post, and twelve post is just gonna completely destroy you. There's no you have no prayer against a deck like twelve post without cards like Damping Sphere and uh, Ruination in the sideboard. In terms of the sideboard, I, I do like the three Hydroblast. Those are definitely staying in. Could there be a fourth Hydroblast? Maybe. Could there be a second melting meltdown? Possibly. I think it's less, you know, we're not seeing as much eight cast thanks to Bowmaster. Um, this second containment priest could potentially be a Graft Digger's Cage. That's a card that I'm considering. Uh, but yeah, I really don't know what to what to put into, you know, as card number uh, 60. I mean, it could be a card like, for example, um, Shark Typhoon, which seems weird, but Shark Typhoon is blue it pitches to force it and it's one of those very flexible cards i like flexible cards i like cheap cards uh i'm not a big fan of four drops and i, I think if you're going to play a three drop it should basically win you the game and to some extent to ferry and our set kind of win you the game snapcaster just so strong i mean you might be able to play like a lightning bolt as a form of removal i don't think lightning bolt's right here either though uh and i don't think prismatic ending number four is right yeah it's tough Anyway, uh, those are my closing thoughts about the deck. I'm going to keep playing with it. Like, I do think that this is potentially better than the Thoughtseize and Bowmaster Esper build. Uh, I think that Murktide is great, but Murktide isn't really what this deck needs to be doing, frankly. Murktide is kind of like, oops, my main plan didn't work, so I'm going to fall back on having a giant Murktide in play. This deck, as, it, as it's built here, is like incredibly value-focused. So, yeah, I, I like the idea of value... And I like the idea of slow incremental grinding uh, against the opponent. Anyway, uh, it's a very long ex I think if you watched to the end of this video, I just want to thank you for tuning in. I hope uh, you give this video a, a thumbs up. I hope you subscribe if you haven't subscribed. And I hope that you leave comments about Stoneblade. I love Stoneforge Mystic. It's like my favorite card of all time. And I'm so thrilled that they continue to print powerful new equipment like Crypticote. And if you think about it, like they're always going to be printing new equipment. Stoneforge Mystic is 
it's bow master proof, right? Like, like they, des- this is like a masterpiece of design in that even with all the power creep, this card is kind of keeps up, uh, it, as the format evolves, Bowma- uh, Stoneforge Mystic kind of gets more powerful as well. So, uh, I, I'm going to keep jamming this. I think that there are lots of control decks, like obviously Beanstalk, you know, potentially better, uh, the Soul Type Beans, which I played, I got a trophy with that a few weeks ago. Uh, but Stoneforge Mystic, love it. Uh, until next time, be excellent to each other and party on, dudes. <laughs>